In figurational sociology, I think that conventional term research carries a particular load because it it is not an enterprise which is separate from theory. I always remember when I was reading on the process of civilization, civilizing the process. Um, I kind of switched between thinking this was a kind of big theoretical treatise at one minute and at another minute thinking this is kind of really all the minutiae of manners and everything else. And uh, I suppose it's both of those things because in any Asian sociology what you have is a different kind of vehicle, a different kind of model for doing sociology. And that's kind of research theorizing. So this is a different way of interweaving theory and research, a different way of thinking about theory. So John was talking earlier about sociology as a kind of practice. And I think that's, the, that's one of the clues to unpacking what it is that Elias does. He has a distinctive kind of uh, sociological practice, which, um, and that's a very different sort of starting point from a lot of other sociological positions, and, and part of what was so appealing to me. Um, around the time at which his work was becoming popular, becoming advocated by the likes of Eric, uh, of Eric Dunning within the UK, Gordner was writing his famous The Coming Crisis of Western Sociology. And Gordner's crisis was that sociologists were increasingly becoming subsumed into the establishment and that they were switching between a range of different domain assumptions based upon untested, unreflected upon values and proclivities, so that you had some who would see the world from a consensus perspective and they would be steering towards uh, functionalism and others who would steer towards a kind of conflict uh, um, to make assumptions and they would kind of adopt more of a Marxist perspective and so on and so forth. But what um, Gordon, who was proto-Marxist, suggested was we need to be more reflexive because the crisis for sociology is that you're going to have this thousand different varieties and you're only gonna, we're not really going to explore the assumptions based uh, uh, um, that those different varieties based upon. Um, but I think Elias maybe takes us a, a step further from that, and, and, and what he gets us to do is to challenge the whole idea of what theory is. Is theory an enterprise that is entirely separate from the process of research? And this is also about the relationship between sociology and philosophy. For a, you know, a long time, the kind of normal way of thinking about this is, is that we should acquiesce to the professional status of philosophers, that, that philosophers are much better placed to sort out the big questions, the grand theoretical questions about what we talk about when we talk about structure or society or power. Uh, um, whereas Elias, Elias, or we have others like Winch, who, who Peter Winch, the idea of uh, social science, who talk about, oh, there are some questions and problems that are philosophical and some that are properly sociological and that we shouldn't mix those two. Domains. Whereas I think what Elias tried to do was to translate some of these thorny conceptual questions into researchable sociological ones. So we were talking on this table, Valerie, you were asking questions about how do we how do we know? How do we know that we're not just going in and reflecting back what we've gone in with into the research process? So Elias famously talked about Homer Clausen's thinking in this connection. That the basis for so much of what philosophers take granted as the basic epistemological premise, how can I know the world, is predicated on the understanding of typically an adult knower looking out and apprehending this thing outside of themselves um, and having that kind of radical epistemic doubt that they can ever fully know this thing outside of me. Um, Elias would ask, well, what, how is it that we've come to conceive of the problem um, of that of an individual knower trying to apprehend and understand and know the world, rather than the problem for an intergenerational figuration of scholars and how they can develop, and there's a key difference here, knowledge which has a higher degree of reality congruence. Um, rather than knowledge which is true, knowledge which is a higher degree of reality congruence. Yeah, yeah. So this is about intelligibility. Could be about intelligibility. But I, I think whenever we do that, whenever we say is it about intelligibility, intelligibility is it about maybe or even like a utilitarian principle, how well it fits. 
Um, we're, we're always reducing it to some sort of timeless arbitrary criteria. And uh, uh, um, I think that leads us towards a kind of Popperian notion uh, um, of ideas around true and true false. Uh, um, that whether we can uh, um, develop knowledge which is true, or whether we can falsify knowledge which is equally valuable from the Popperian standpoint, through some sort of logical test, logical forms of proof, demonstration, and so on and so forth. Um, whereas I think Elias has a completely different image of how sociological knowledge might develop. Um, and it's not through the, this kind of testing. We think it's a different kind of testing. It's a kind of, it, 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 it's a kind of a, a much longer term project. But those questions about how, we'll come to involvement and attachment in that discussion, but questions about reality congruence, questions about the worth of what we do, aren't simply questions pertaining to following a particular procedure. Um, they aren't just questions about cognitive distancing. They are questions which pertain to the whole federation of the knowers and the knowledge producers involved. And I think that's a really important insight. And it's one of the ways in which you can translate some of these timeless epistemological questions into research for such questions. But this, this coming crisis of empirical sociology it, it has stayed with us. We, we, we had from the 70s onwards all these different paradigms, loads of different ground clearing exercises. Uh, I mean, at the time that Gordon was writing, the Marxists, the structuralists, the functionalists, the ethnomethodologists, the symbolic interactionists, and so on, and so forth, the functionalists. Um, and one of the problems it, with sociology is it becomes all of these things. You know, when you introduce new students to the discipline, it, 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 it's a bewildering task to teach them what is sociology. There's no kind of central, coherent canon to sociology beyond Marx, Weber, Durkheim, 101. And that's part of its richness, but it also is restricting um, to certain degrees. And I think Elias's call in this respect is to develop a central theory. And that doesn't, it's not the same as a middle range theory. Um, and it's not simply figuration of sociology as a central theory. But it's theory which is couched at a level of synthesis, which is still not grand, so so far uh, um, to divorce from the empirical process that uh, uh, um, you know, it, it almost kind of escapes testing in any kind of meaningful sense, and that you have to constantly superimpose it into that which you're looking at. And equally, not simply a kind of like a grounded theory, idea of theory, which is just this kind of emergent theory. Something in the center, something between those. Catch that level of synthesis, which will allow the different work of different scholars within the discipline to link up. So that, I think that's one of the ways that um, Elias's work is interesting, because it offers a different promise for the sociological enterprise. Uh, and, and, and this is where, um, Andrew and I were talking about this a second ago, I think uh, um, my supervisor, the person I was taught Elias, who taught me Elias, Eric, was very much tied up in that kind of, not proselytizing, I think that's an unfair way to put it, but very much tied up with the enterprise of trying to counter that situation and say, well, look, there is another way. This figurational sociology offers us a different way of doing research, of researching the human society. Um, but I think now we've, we've got to a point where there are so many different ways. What we need is some kind of conciliation, some kind of rebuilding of uh, 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 based around trying to build some kind of consensus as to what it is that we're doing with, uh, with sociology and what we're doing as sociologists. Um, and this, this is not a, a complete move away from eclecticism and, the, and, and, and what you were talking about, Liz, about being able to apply the life spectacle, I think is really, really productive. But it is a move towards starting to think about how can we join our work up with that of the Borgesian scholars or the, the Foucaultian scholars or whatever else? What, how can we find common ground? Because we're never going to get, I don't think we're at a stage yet where we can have this kind of once and for all having a single paradigm winning the day, but we, we might be able to, to find some commonalities, some conciliations such that we can have a clearer sense of what, what it is that we're doing as, um, as sociologists and how our work can link up. 
Because it's one of the things that really ticks me off. You know? So you have, uh, um, on broadcast media, you'll have something about, I don't know, a mass killing in the United States. And they'll always trot out the psychologist. You know? This is what made him do it. And it's usually a man. Uh, um, he has selective mutism. Yeah? And he had some kind of problems back in his childhood. And of course, those questions, those points, they, those explanations, they have their place. Right? They're important. But what you don't get is a discussion of under what social conditions did this take place? How did this come to be? How did it come to be that almost every week we have a mass shooting, for example, in the United States and we don't somewhere else? How is that something to do with gun laws in the United States? How is that something to do with hyper-masculinity? How is that something to do with the expression of violence, this kind of oscillation between this passivity and this, these kind of extreme things? Sorry, I did promise I wasn't going to go on. But I, I think... I think that, that kind of question, and it really irritates me because sociologists have got great things to say about this. But one of the, what they tend to do is they tend to come out and they say, well, it's more complex than that. That seems to be the stock sociological answer. And that's great because what you're not getting is some glib, glib, psychologistic explanation of everything, but it's also one of the frustrating things. And I guess what I'm arguing for is it wouldn't it be great if sociology could develop to the point where there was a bit more of a consensus as to what it is that we're doing and a bit more joining up of what we're doing and that we might be able to, to, to paraphrase the line, I think, to, to start to build small islands of certainty in the last section of our ignorance. So that was my, my, my starting point, was to think about what, what is research in integration and sociology, what's theory, what's the relationship between theory and research? Should we even be asking that question, what's the relationship between theory and research? Should we be thinking instead of our research theorising as the vehicle for sociology. And then how do you do that is the next step. What does that look like? How does one proceed as an individual? How do groups of sociologists and intergenerational scholars proceed and develop research theory? It also brought me to another thing at the conference today, um, which, is, which is linked to another paper called The Coming Crisis, and not coincidentally, which, uh, uh, um, was by um, Burroughs and Baird, uh, um, The Coming Crisis of Western Empirical Sociology. I don't know if you've read this. It's a sociological research in mind. It was published about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, something like that. Um, and what they were arguing, um, uh, Michael Burroughs and David Baird, um, is that, uh, uh, is that right? No, Mike Savage. Mike Savage, Mike Savage. Yeah. sorry, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Mike Savage. Scrum yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there was a follow up, wasn't it? With, with, with Burroughs. Um, what they were, yeah, Savage et al. <laughs> what well, I mean, was that the, the coming crisis was that um, was was an empirical one. That what's happened now in the advent of uh, an era of big data is that your average analytic firm has uh, um, at its fingertips incredible data. Um, whereas a sociologist typically goes out with her or his clipboard and collects survey data or um, does interviews or focus groups or whatever it is um, and ask people to tell them about their behaviours, tell researchers about what it is that they do. The data analytics firm, typically commercial enterprises, can actually, can actually have a total sample of the full population moving through the world in real terms. Doesn't have to ask people about what they do, can actually see what people do, albeit through the traces they leave in the digital world. And so the crisis for sociology then becomes how can we distinguish what we say from what anyone can say? Because we no longer have uh, a methodological basis. Our evidence is no longer superior to that of your average analytics firm. But I think again, this is problematic because what this is also about again, is the relationship between theory and research. Surely what, the difference between what we say and what anyone can say isn't just on the basis of how good our data are or how well we follow methodological procedures um, or, or, or by the, uh, the precision of our methodological standards or whatever it is. We, we use all these kind of proxy words like rigor and, uh, and, and being systematic. Right? But surely it's about how we imagine their findings from those data, how we link the insights that we get from looking at concrete empirical phenomena uh, um, and how 
we interweave those with our theories. Um, and, and so it is about theory and research once again. And I think, so, you know, yeah, we can imagine some kind of data science from a federational perspective that could tell us some really interesting points of view, or, or from any sociological perspective, we could, could reveal some really interesting uh, um, insights. Which brings me to a third point, which is about this, I, I did promise that research, human and society, but I'll fold the last two in together, which is uh, and that Elias referred to himself as a human scientist, which is quite an interesting thing, and saw, uh, uh, so this locution of the human scientist researching the, uh, 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 wasn't, wasn't, it was a human scientist, not a social scientist, and that's because Part, partly because he wanted to overcome a divide between the humanities and the social sciences. And I remember when Laurie was looking to do a master's here, my big sell was, well, you know, you've got this background in English uh, and, and English literature, and I, you know, I had this understanding of the classics. I could think of a few better uh, um, bases from which to go on and study a master's in sociology. But of course, that's, that was based in part by what I thought sociology was, and the kind of values are you know, to what sociology is. Um, and so this is how these things start filling up, that uh, uh, um, Elias is in play between theory and research, his understanding of the kind of sources that we can look at, uh, um, and the kind of relationship between the humanities and the social sciences. It's not accidental that he calls himself a human scientist. Um, we're going to do a session on Eric tomorrow. One of the things that always struck me about Eric Dunning was at the time he was developing his master's thesis on football, just how much opposition he would have received to doing something like that. Around that time, you know, doing something on sport or on leisure, that was really esoteric. Not really esoteric, sorry, but really superficial. Uh, um, sociologists need to look at work in industry, they need to look at the economy, they need to look at these kind of important areas, not everyday uh, 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 whimsies of sport and leisure. Um, but that, again, is, 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 is the kind of the, the, the normal stuff, the mainstay of literature, is to look at our private lives, to look at um, the everyday. Um, and, um, and I think that's one of the really interesting things about thinking about Elias or using Elias, is it, is it enables you to get from Again, Gary Armstrong has referred to Elias as a sociologist of the handkerchief, uh, which I think is quite witty, right? Uh, Gary was a colleague of mine at Brunel University, he's now at the City University. But yeah, he is a sociologist of the handkerchief. He is a sociologist of knives and forks. He's also a sociologist of concentration camps, extermination camps. He's a sociologist of violence and football terrorism and football within it. Um, He's a sociologist of all these things, but what he enables you to do is to bridge that divide between this kind of seemingly meaningless, quotidian, routine, humdrum aspects of life, and somehow get from that to the traverse of Western civilization. And I anticipate one of the things that we're going to talk about is how do you do that? How does Elias do that? How does he get, uh, um, and, and, and does he do that? You know, is, is it just a stylized way of linking fragments of data, or does he do something else? And I'll, and I'll finish with this, which is, I think, funnily enough, one of the ways that I started to think in a formal sense about what is in this sociological practice of a life, this different vehicle, this research theorizing, um, is that it's, it's, yes, it's inductive, yes, it's deductive, yes, it can both combine those two bits. But it was in reading a, a book by Howard Becker, so that anybody knows me knows I'm a big fan of Howard Becker. Um, for he, this book, Evidence, is it, it, it's, it's his most recent book, um, where he talks about his approach being abductive. It's very un esque to use a kind of term like that. He doesn't, he, he doesn't like labeling himself, and he doesn't like theory in that, in this bit of capital T. Um, but what he, but he's written two or three books, What About Mozart and, and, and uh, the Telling About Society, which, is a, which are all about reasoning from cases. Um, and, if he, and I think that's quite interesting because that's exactly what Elias does. He reasons from cases. Um, but he does so in a particular kind of way. And 
the example I use in the book with Eric about how he does this and the kind of questions that leads you to ask um, is an old style motion picture book real. And this is really low technology because everything's digital. But we, if, if we were to pull out an old style motion picture reel, we could see each individual frame in time series. And what epistemological questions typically ask us to do is to look at a single frame and to say, from whose perspective was that shot? Is that an accurate view of what was happening at that particular time? What's missing? What's outside of this frame? You know, from what standpoint was that particular frame taken? Were there any aberrations on the emulsion when that was developed? And so on and so on and so forth. Whereas I think where Elias reasons from these particular cases is to ask different kinds of questions. And John and I have written about this in the, uh, in, in, in the documents of well, oh, the Ilya Neustadt paper, uh, 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 BJS article. He, he, asked, he asked essentially three kinds of questions, which is one is how, how has this come to be? So that eventually, that ultimately means you've got to look at the other stills in this motion picture. How are these interrelated? How does it link to the other things that you can see around it? And what broader chains of interdependence are involved in, in, in this? So for Elias, that particular fragment, in and of itself, if, if we go down the conventional epistemological frame, we will be compelled to ask things like, you know, is this part, this is an official source, is it part of the official record? Can we corroborate this? This is the mainstay of historical methods. So we're starting to get to that point about the difference between historical analyses and sociological. Whereas I think Elias will reason from each time series example, whether that's excerpts from Manners books or whatever it is over time, and look at the analytical connections. And then as a whole, as a, as a, a gestalt, a chronic gestalt, um, we can then present not individual fragments, but the whole argument, the whole interweaving of the theory and the evidence. And we can then offer that out and say, Okay, how well does this, how well does this fit in future research theory? So it's a different kind of logic that's used. It's not a statistical logic that would be used, say, with, uh, uh, um, with random sampling. If I randomly sample this many, then it speaks to the broader population. Um, it's not that kind of claim, and it's not the same kind of claim that one would make typically for a thematic analysis. And the more I've been thinking about this recently, and I think there's some quite interesting things to say about thematic analysis, because quite often those become proto-quantitative paradoxically, the bulk of my participants said, and things like that. Um, it's, 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 it is maybe a that it is, it's an analytical logic that gets you to these other things. And I think therein there's some quite complicated, uh, um, but, but there's some, some, some possibilities around what it is that you do when you do thematic analysis. So I won't go on any more. And that are then my opening remarks, and maybe we can pick up on some of those things in the questions and answers. And I'm really hoping my colleagues can help chip in on some of these, uh, uh, some of these bits as well. Mm -hmm. okay, can, I just, can I say something about the uh, one, of, one of the interesting aspects of this for me was my, my first encounter, or my first encounters with Elias, was through the Young Worker Project, and it's here where you see how. Uh, Elias's practice was at odds with the conventions of uh, British empirical social science of the 50s and 60s. So that, that project was a survey of 850 young people in Leicester and their experiences of work, that transition from school to work. And um, what Elias wanted to do was to develop these cases, as, as Jason said, the research team on that project didn't understand that approach and said, well, wh why are we doing all this survey work when all you want to do is cherry pick the these cases to, to explore a theory? Yeah. Uh, and that project ended in, in failure because this real tension between that kind of Eliasian reality congruence, uh, you know, uh, theorising based on data, as compared to the rest of the research team that were classically a trained British empirical survey researchers. And so again, I just thought I'd give that as a, an illustration of, of what this, this tension is not a new one. 
Likewise, this idea of you know Eric being told, you know the, the kind of criticisms of Eric being told what he can, you know, couldn't couldn't research football is not a legitimate area of inquiry. It's not that long ago that we wrote that letters paper, and it's not that long ago that we were told by our head of department at that point that letters were not a valuable source of data. And why should we concern ourselves with the correspondence between these two old academics? Take you nowhere. Yeah. Take you nowhere. So what, what and the, the argument there was actually you should forget all this stuff. You should specialise in a niche area, work and employment being, being the one. Um, and so the, these things again are not are not new. I, I've just got in mind, you know, Alvin Goldner et al. I just wonder whether sociology is always in a state of crisis. Mm -hmm. You know, Tony Benn's phrase, every generation has to solve the same problems over and over again and we we wrestle with this, so what I was saying earlier about, you know, I think there is a, a, a crisis in the way that we train sociologists and how sociologists become sociologists. They don't become sociologists, they become sociologically oriented technicians, they can do chi-squares, they can uh, they understand what Marx says, but that's very different to being a sociologist. Um, anyway, it's a long-winded route round. I wanted you to say something about the kind of reality congruence partisan track issue. So this idea that a lot of sociology begins with a political starting point as opposed to a, a sociological question and the implications that that has for, for, what, for what we do. That's a hell of a thorny <coughs> problem. Uh, um, well, I mean, so the idea of starting without a political starting point is also yeah. That, that we can somehow go into the field completely neutral. And uh, in as much as we've chosen a particular topic and we've said this is worthy of interest and this is worthy of social potential, we're already putting ourselves in a particular position, we're aligning ourselves uh, in a particular kind of way. So, what do we do with that? Um, Elias's argument is about uh, um, the balance between autonomous and heteronomous evaluations. So his question is, how is it, how would it be possible to replace uh, um, the various individual, perhaps even collective, uh, um, heteronomous evaluations uh, um, that, are, that are brought to bear on the, the research process? So you go and research something and uh, um, let's say it, it, it's even something quite benign. You want to go and research schools and straight away you go in with the question, um, how can we improve educational performance? Yes? And that's, that's how we'll go into a school. And that is, in a narrow political sense, a kind of political uh, uh, investment in the research process. So how is it that we can become aware of what we're doing? And again, I'm going to link to Becky here, because his, his example is instructive. He does say that, you know, says that when we go and research schools, we do tend to look at why is it that uh, girls are now outperforming boys, why is it that certain social groups do better than others, and so on and so forth. And what we don't do is ask why Mr. Fletcher, our history teacher, is such a dick. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, because we take for granted what we bring into that encounter and what question we do, we take for granted the perspective of policy makers and those that actually fund the research. So we, we need to think about how it is over time we might be able to balance that with uh, uh, um, with the evaluation. So, so, so for Elias, I think, I mean, and it's always a dangerous thing to, to kind of boil it down into one principle, but I think it's something like moving away from a kind of simply idealistic starting point, how the world ought to be, or, and I'm, and I'm using the term in a very specific way, a critical starting point, how the world ought not to be, and towards seeking to find out how the world actually is. Now therein I've invoked a kind of classic fact-value distinction, and we all know problems with doing that, um, but that at the essence is what it is. And again, for Elias that is not simply a question of getting the methodological procedure right, or uh, of doing the research, getting the method right. It's a question of how is it uh, that federations of sociologists might, over time, 
be able to develop institutional safeguards that prevent the import of these exterior, inverted commas exterior, just trying to slide seeking into it, so. Richard Kilminster has talked about different tracts in sociology. Um, so there's the two tracts of sociology, so partisan and non-partisan tract. Both have values and political values being brought into their research, but in different ways. For partisan tract sociologists, whether that's LGBT, whether that's whatever it is, uh, feminist scholars or, or whatever it is, those values have to be checked up front and reflected upon. Uh, and right, so, but they, they, they inform the kind of questions you got, that you ask, and they sensitise you to the, perhaps, the workings of certain kinds of power, certain kinds of problems, and all the rest of it. For non-partisan tracks, sociologists, and again, it's, it's always a bit glitch to evoke a simple distinction, there is a different kind of role for values in the research process. And it's a different kind of enterprise. And Elias refers to that as a detour by attachment. So it's noteworthy that Elias always encourages students to go in and to do research on areas that they themselves had personal involvement in and that they knew something about. And that you could get all kinds of insights uh, uh, um, from, 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 from having that involved knowledge that you don't have as an outsider. Um, a lot of his examples in that tome, Involvement and Detachment, are like Fishman and Maelstrom. They're examples that champion detachment. But he also uses a few involvement examples. He says something like, while you don't need to know what it feels like to be an atom to study molecules, you do need to know from the inside, so, so to speak, what it means to be human, to understand human consciousness, and so on and so forth. So the idea of involvement and detachment is to start there, but then go on kind of detour. And what does that detour mean? Well, that's, that's the big question. Um, but it is a, a, a particular way of not checking, but it's a, it's a kind of heightened awareness of, of the limits of that involved knowledge. So the uh, only way I can, I can, I can do this in a, in a less abstract way is to talk about my PhD research. It's funny, I always go back there, because that was on smoking. And of course, I had a lot of involved knowledge on smoking because I was a bit of a layabout who loved smoking and drinking. You know, that, was, that was the starting point for mine. Unlike Eric's very sporty football, mine was smoking. And there was also sort of thing. I knew what it felt like to smoke. I knew what I thought the enjoyment of smoking was. That, that was all really important. But I had no understanding of why um, I felt that way or how that particular way of feeling was not an accident and was actually linked to a broader set of social processes. So I was able to, to, to go on this detour by detachment. And the idea is you don't just end with detachment, that at the end of this, you come back, and armed now with the more detached knowledge, you alloy that with your more involved knowledge. Um, and hopefully this alloy of involved and detached knowledge, the different ratios, uh, um, enables you to then intervene in the sphere of human figuration in ways that have a higher degree of intelligibility to unintended consequences. And I can drop that phrase off because that was in our book together. And we thought long and hard about what that is. Because um, we might go in with a view to improving the lot of this one particular group over here, but that might have the unintended consequences of screwing it up for this other group over there. How is it that we can Secure And built into Alliance's work is an understanding that if we have knowledge which has a better fit with reality, and then we can use scare quotes for the moment if we need to, uh, um, a knowledge with a better fit to that which it, to which it pertains, then that will serve as more reliable. Kind of as a, as a, the, the more fantasy laden our knowledge, the less likely it is. These fantasies have some reality congruence, but the more fantasy laden the less likely it is to serve as a secure and reliable basis for those kind of interventions in, in the world. And so Richard Kilminster has talked about this and said that alloys of involvement detachment involve channeling those kind of incredibly passionate political imp imp impulses and impetuses into trying to understand the world. Understand first, then act, but act in ways that are likely to secure what you want them to, that aren't just egocentrically rewarding, aren't just emotionally satisfied. 
I remember Eric's work. Eric, Eric did the uh, used the example of Penny, uh, um, the Penny of football hooligans back in the 1980s. Did all this work with Sir Norman Chester on Penny of football hooligans, and the kind of highly fancy laden understanding of football hooliganism and why they did it at that time was because they were animals. They're animals, so we're going to treat them like animals. This was the kind of Thatcher mantra of the time. What we're going to do is pack pen them in, and you can see the fans. You know, who are split you know, by literally like pig pens at the, at the terraces, facing off in a football match. And of course, that was egocentrically rewarding to talk about football hooligans in that way that they're animals. And of course, that was it was fancy -based. And what it did was displace the violence so it took place in far more orchestrated ways and on a much larger scale outside the grounds instead of within the terraces. So it was just a simple example, but the one that comes to mind of, 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 of how, if, if you want to control football, who are going to try and understand it first? Uh, sorry, I'm going on a little bit, but, but that, 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 that those, two, those twin tracks of sociology involve different understandings of when you act. So this idea that, so, that the Federation of Sociology can't be allied to any kind of activism is something I've thought a great deal about. And I, I, I'm doing a paper at the moment. You've seen it, Andrew, the Fields, Worlds and Federations, and Michael's coming, uh, co-writing it uh, uh, with me about what kind of activism it is. Because I think in Elias' work itself, even though Joe uh, um, uh, Kaufman said at Elias' funeral that, that Elias Elias' work was not intended to serve any particular power. And that's right, he, 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 wasn't, he didn't really believe in politics, definitely not party politics, because he felt that uh, uh, um, most of them are based on, kind of on, on utopian notions, and utopias are literally nowhere places, they are, they are fantasies that don't exist. But whether or not Elias took sides in political discussions, his ideas did. And there's something in the idea of the critique of individualism, <coughs> critique of homoclausis, which is, well, you could use now against Trump, you could use, you know, it, it positions itself, you could very easily position that on a political spectrum. So some of those ideas do need thinking through, uh, uh, and their implications need thinking through. Sorry, I'm going on too much, but that's but just some thoughts on that. Can I ask you three questions? Yeah. Short questions. <laughs> short short <laughs> answers. <laughs> yeah. One is, the idea that sociology needs a centre fills some of us with horror. We've escaped from sociology having a centre. It was destructive, it was horrible, it was punitive, it was authoritarian, it was generally crap. Um, and those of us who've inhabited the peripheries welcome the existence of the peripheries because that's where the best thinking is done from. So the, so the question is, why the hankering after bolting Elias onto other things? And is that to smarten up Elias to make him as respectable as Bourdieu or as respectable as someone else? Yeah. Um, so that's, that's one question. The, the second question is a simpler one. We're all familiar with talking about theorising. There is no methods equivalent. Don't you think? I mean, I think that's really interesting. And may, maybe uh, it, it would be um, useful if you could perhaps sort of think, you know, tell us why in terms of the schema of things that you've been out, 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 outlining. So, why, so what, for Elias, I mean, there's no... Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, you know, theory, there is a process, but... Yeah. Um, and, and, I, and, I, and I, you know, I'm not happy with the idea of applying theory because theory, theorising is a response to a set of circumstances as a very sort of flexible, iterative process. But people never talk about method like that. Yeah. So there's no method, methodologizing or whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever the word is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So within the schema that you've been outlining, do you have some ideas about why that is? And also, my last question is, why, why didn't you talk about the? the. There, are, there are four figurationally provocative and interesting oh, right, terms. Yeah, yeah, and the is one of them. Yeah, yeah. Elias is the man who writes about personal names in one yeah. place. Yeah. He writes about pronouns in a couple of other places. Yeah. Um, and one of the ways in which we, you know, uh, uh, Amelia and I have been trying to develop some of Elias's ideas is, is, is by looking at terms like the, in a South African context, to refer to the boy means one thing, to call somebody boy means something really very different. Yeah, yeah. You know, so the, in, in lots of ways, is the most sort of politically and intellectually resonant of the, of the four words in, in that phrase. Mm -hmm.
So that's the, 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 the others are questions, but... Um, well, I'll take a third and, one and, first, because I'm going to be short. The question as well. The shortest Why answer that is... Because I wasn't clever enough. I mean, <laughs> it's, a really, it's, a good, it's a good observation, I totally agree. I think you, you could. Uh, uh, the human society, of course, yeah. Um, I mean, I think... Uh, uh, um, I'm, yeah, I maybe want to make that. I'll come, I'll come back to that, because uh, I've got some thoughts there. The first thing is about no centre. Uh, and I think I can see why it would fill you with horror. Uh, and I can, I can see why people object to it. And I've written a, I've written a piece called The Habits of the Sociology, which is all about this, and about how uh, uh, um, the idea of central theory flouts some of the kind of, let's call it for the moment, extra scientific standards of what constitutes good sociology. But for me, for... for uh, um, it would depend a lot what that centre looks like and what it comprises. And I guess the kind of the kind of centre I'm interested in is, yeah, you don't all have to get with Elias. You don't all have to sign up to the same singular paradigm. But maybe we can agree that there is a common and collective enterprise amongst sociologists to try and understand the work. And to get, whether we're doing work on e-cigarettes and working at Grace, or we're doing work on genocidal regimes or whatever it is, that we have some basis for that work to join up. And that because it's only through having something like that that we might be able to build these kind of small islands about society as a whole and not just these kind of tiny little bits of it. I think one of the problems is also more practical in that respect is that, um, society, that sociology is over-specialised. There are now so many specialisms within sociology that it's lost its coherence and it would take a lifetime to have even the most basic understanding of every single aspect of that discipline. And part of the reason why people take up theory as a specialism in its own right is that's one way to deal with it. Another way to deal with that is to go, right, okay, I'm going to do any empirical reason, I'm going to be a sociologist of work and organisations, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So I think, I think uh, um, that's, one, that's my vision of the same. I don't know if it means you know, you have to go back to the kind of what the post-structuralists were criti criticising in relation to that centre. I don't think it means that you have to have a kind of a heterodoxy. And, and, you know, one of the things we might also think about is the institutional success of sociology. Um, and, I mean, at the moment, sociology has a little bit of an image problem. Uh, um, and you, you, you confront this when recruiting prospective students. Depends um, where you are. Well, well, okay, you're in Edinburgh. But I mean, I think nationally, the portrayal of sociology in the media in the UK isn't that positive. Uh, um, I don't think it's an overgeneralisation to say that. And uh, um, that, that a lot of the ideas about what sociology are, you can say whatever you like about it, because it's kind of many things to many people. Um, and the worst portrayals are it's a Mickey Mouse discipline, which takes us back to the kind of uh, bygone age and isn't a lot of relevant. Uh, and obviously, I don't think that. But but part of the problem with sociology is it's failed to professionalise as a discipline. Um, and I'm the first to criticise the kind of the overdependent psychological positivism in, in, in economics. But and I'm not, I'm not suggesting we just don't like economics in that respect. In, in, respect of embracing a singular kind of orthodoxy or the kind of spurious mesmerization with complex mathematical models but nonetheless uh, that center to different branches of economics has been productive to the natural point and the same can be said for psychology we've got the BPS across the road right there they can determine how many students you can have as a maximum star student ratios uh, and that informs the kind of quality of the experience for new people coming into the discipline and so forth. I think all of that is predicated upon some centre to psychology. That's a very professional way of thinking of sociology, and I'm thinking of Paul Marx. You know, what about sociology of a, di of a different kind that doesn't just inhabit the university, I mean, increasingly just the university? I'm not discounting that, and I can see uh, there's some very professional Marxists, and they've made a career out of taking Marx's standpoint and, uh, 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 and applying that approach again and again. So I'm not conflating those two things, 
But I, again, I'm not saying this would somehow leave out alternative perspectives. And I think one of the things that I think needs to be done is to find more common ground between, say, figurational sociologists and the multitude of other approaches that are there, and to try and kind of move to a more conciliatory phase, because the over-specialisation, the multi paradigmatic character of sociology at the moment, has kind of reached its limit in terms of its utility for a flourishing of the discipline. I think that, 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 that for it to go any further, some, some kind of center needs to be established, but we might not agree on that. The, the, the second point about methodologi methodologizing, or, or, some, something. or something like that, is really interesting, because I think I agree, uh, uh, um, and I think Eric is fond of, was fond of telling me um, that when uh, he spoke to Elias about methodology, um, that Elias turned around and said, uh, um, I don't have a methodology, I might have a method. The idea of methodology is a philosophical precept, uh, um, that the, the idea that we can have a science of method in and of itself is, is highly problematic. But I'll have to think about it. But um, what's interesting there, I think, is that when we think about the relationship between theory and method, we're in a much more productive room. So we were talking about, for example, a very simple thing, yeah, this, this, this point, Lawrence, about how does, does federational sociology always mean you've got to go to infinite regrets? And that kind of question is germane to the concrete empirical <coughs> that you're investigating. It's got to be. It's got to be linked to what it is that you're looking at. So, Anthony, we start around 1900 for Taiwan. Is that right? Or 18? What is it? Where's the starting point for your thesis? Uh, 1895, after Taiwan was ceded to Japan. So, after uh, um, Taiwan being ceded to Japan. And why is that important? Why is that the important time frame for your thesis? Yeah, because. Um That's the point. Uh, Taiwan departs from the history of China. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so again, so the, 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 rather than sort of saying, right, you've got to always look at this in terms of five hundred year time span or a fifty year time span or a five thousand year time span, or always go back to the Big Bang or whatever it is, you you make a substantive, informed judgment about what it is that you can say on the back of looking at this time frame and how that links to the particular problem that you're looking at. But that's also a theoretical question, because you're sensitive towards what's going on at the interstate level here. You're interested in the formation of habitus, and how that can be captured by looking at museums as part and parcels of figuration. So all of these things link up. The kind of questions that you ask in relation to method, the questions that you, you look at in relation to theory. And jo John and I, uh, uh, and my sister Karen, were looking at this in the Human Documents and Figuration paper as well. That, that um, those kind of questions about how we do methods. There, there are very few books that have been written on documentary research. The, the one that stands out is John Scott's A Matter of Recording, I know you know it. Uh, um, and his approach to these kind of questions is kind of quasi-critical realist, which is in terms of when you select a particular document, you need to check it against these, these standard criteria, which is credibility, authenticity, and so on and so forth. And that, that kind of judgment, I think, takes us back to the motion picture, still real, all over again. Uh, and but those kind of judgments have their place, they're important. But we should also think about, in terms of document selection, whether we look at letters, or whether we look at the formal historical record, is bound up with the kind of questions that we're asking, is bound up with the kind of theoretical approach that we're trying to interweave with our social support and in our social support. So as the second part, oh, you did say short answers. So, <laughs> so the, the, the third part is the human society. Um, and I think we could, we could say researching human societies um, and then using that, that the, and thinking about the itself, problematizing it is very clever and very sort of, I think the, the, the place it was also taking me is to this question that my, my, it is my unease with Elias when I first encountered the concept of reality congruence was based in my social training. There's no such thing as reality. There's only multiple realities. 
And the idea of a singular intractable reality that, and, the, and the possibility for its rational encapsulization in, in, a, in a single theory would, would fill me with dread back then. And I think it's only through having some kind of sense of this thing that we can see how, yeah, multiple realities, depending on what we mean by that, might come to join up, might come to be linked together in ways that we've not been able to find if we'd all been looking at these in a very specialised and separate way. I'd like to go back to sociology in crisis, um, crisis in sociology, and look at what others do right rather than what sociology does wrong. Yeah. Um, and my question is, so what is it that other social sciences disciplines do right um, that lay people immediately know or immediately identify what a psychologist does and so that's why they ask him to come on mainstream media and talk yeah. about the massacre. Um, how is it that we identify what a, sociologist, what a psychologist does or what an economist does or what a philosopher does yeah. um, but we have trouble with facing sociologists? Well, in some ways they do it right for a, 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 in one sense but not in another. You know, so what psychologists often do is they come in and they peddle these kind of glib explanations for everything. And, and that's great from a media broadcast standpoint because you've got this kind of nice soundbite that you can use to explain something. It might be completely bereft as an adequate explanation of something. And likewise, economists have been fantastic at influencing governments that what they have, what their knowledge is, is, is worthwhile. But um, we've all been at the mercy of some of those, and quite literally, you know, some of those theories being applied in these kind of brutal ways, uh, um, with, with massive unintended consequences. Um, so, I guess, they don't face the same kind of professional and institutional crisis that sociology faces. But they might paradoxically face an epistemic one, for all the good reasons that that Liz was talking about, in, in, in not having kind of healthy pluralism uh, uh, um, and uh, maybe, uh, um, and, and that's the point to which the kind of plurality of different perspectives is useful. But what they are doing right is, is, I think you can definitely say, in a way that you can't necessarily say within sociology, that there are more sophisticated models within economics now than there were 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, and in psychology as well, if you love it or hate it, and then I know, you know this stuff around neuroscience. And there's some great work by Vera Viola, though it's in Spanish, and I haven't had it through translation by uh, somebody I know when I was at a conference in Brazil, uh, on the relationship between some of the most recent insights from neuroscience um, and, and Elias's uh, work. All this stuff around neuroplasticity and it's linked to notions of habits is really fascinating work. From, of course, when psychologists start to plug in sociological insights, you know, so there's like that great book by Damasio, uh, Descartes' Era, and as soon as he starts to wander into the realms of sociology, it's really, really bad sociology, it gets plugged into it and really quite simplistic reasons. Um, but, yeah, but th th there is development. And there are, you know, there, there are, even from 10 years ago, the, the, the development in psychology in the last 20 years is, is yeah. phenomenal. I mean, it's night and day different, the, the amount of understanding that we have. All, all the these specialist cognitive areas, but there really is manifestly these kind of developments. In a way, I don't think you can say in sociology, or maybe you can say only in specific areas. You know, because we look back to some of those, oh, well, maybe it's, it's my own sort of my own sort of taste to a degree. I look back to some of that Chicago school stuff from the 1960s, wow, 1960s. You know, some of that's a lot more sophisticated, much more insight rich than some of what's getting published in social media journals today. But there are other areas where clearly there's this kind of, and, and, and of course to, to say that means you've got to move towards some things, some words that are very dangerous in sociology. For example, the idea of progress in sociology and knowledge. I mean, I that's, really have I, I, it's been shaped, yeah. right? I mean, to say that kind of work, yeah, yeah, yeah. and to say that, 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 that there might be knowledge which is better yeah. by these explicit criteria now than it once was. 
I think I was, I, I am thinking about um, from an institutional point of view, because I know BSA has been struggling, at least in the last 10 years that I know, about putting a better image to sociology uh, in the UK. And I don't know what the BPS does yeah. uh, to do, if they have any similar programs like that, yeah. or if, you know, bringing social, sociology in schools and mainstreaming it in a way that is palatable and, and like So from an institutional point of view, it would be better. So I mean, partly they don't have to because, uh, because of where we are, but in the, in, in, from my understanding, the 1970s and the 1980s, sociology was a far more a sexy choice mm. than, than economics or psychology. So, so what's happened? And, and, and the BPS was also, uh, uh, um, is also very good at uh, uh, linking up with schools and linking up with the curriculum and having a, having a, a dialogue between what goes on at A level and, and mm. what goes on at university in a way that the BSA needs to now. Um, so, for example, with the phasing out of AS levels uh, within the UK, a lot of people, a lot of students, you try, try on sociology for science. Um, uh, AS level, um, and since that's gone, there are fewer people taking sociology as they are, as I understand it, I'm being told. Um, and what's what's sociology done to do that? And, and I think there could be a loads done. And there's, I'm, I'm overgeneralizing to say that there's nothing being done. You know, there's the campaign for social science, for example, which is brilliant at showing how you learn some amazing employability skills when you learn sociology because you learn about critical reasoning. Um, actually, your graduate salary as a sociologist is better than some STEM sub subjects, so you know, uh, um, average on average, in general speaking. But, but yeah, I, I do feel like that, they, that, that those they are more professional, there are more institutional safeguards, um, and it's a lot harder within psychology and within economics, uh, maybe not so much economics, to talk absolute nonsense about the world, but it's quite easy in sociology to, to do that. Uh, um, and I mean, this is, this is where I might get shot by someone. <laughs> <laughs> some of the audience members, but I, I do feel like that. I feel like uh, uh, I, I, you know, This is a very controversial paper that my colleague Chris Rojek, who you also know, wrote, called the decorative term in sociology. And he did get a lot of flack for it, but what he said was, you know, there's a kind of formula to, to getting a paper published in the right journal. Of course, it's not that easy. But you could come up with the most banal empirical study and then kind of liberally salt it with some Deleuze and Guattari and some trendy left band French theory. And it doesn't really have to be an organic fit between the theory and the evidence. You just superimpose it on there and hey presto, you've got a bit of robust sounding sociology. You know, and it's this divorce of theory and research, this, this, this treatment of theory as a thing that doesn't necessarily need an object, and you can just lend it an object that underlines that capacity to be able to do that. And I think maybe there are more checks and balances, <coughs> at least in terms of what constitutes nonsense from a psychology perspective or from an economics perspective, to stop that from happening. We don't have that. Stephen Mayer rather provocatively talked about it as a need for a waste disposal system in, 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 in sociology. And I think, but of course, you know, who's waste, which, which, which quite, but, but there's something in that. Um, that's kind of related to that and, and to one of the questions that Liz has. Um, this kind of building bridges with <clears throat> other kind of uh, sociologists, specifically sociologists and others. Um, I'm just wondering what, to what extent do you think that other sociologists will be willing to do that with figurational sociologists? Yeah. Should, uh, uh, and should figurational sociologists perhaps be prepared to drop some aspects? Um, also, can you reconcile um, perhaps figurational sociology with um, a partisan track, I think related to that, also um, sociologists that tend to retreat to the present. You know, we're talking about long-term social processes you know, with respect to Antony's PhD. I mean, is there any way that they can be reconciled? What were the practical steps? That's a five-part question. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're supposed to be on the panel, by the way, Mike. Well, <laughs> So what was the first bit again? The, the first bit was... So it's building bridges with other building bridges. Yeah, I think that's a really important part of it, actually. Yeah. Um, 
Richard Kilminster talks about the anticipatory motif, doesn't it? Mm. So that you 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 uh, um, you work on the basis that at some point in the future, what you do is going to be able to link up with other people, mm. and you approach the sociological uh, enterprise in, in in that particular way, um, and that that enables you to kind of to, to discount these kind of petty differences mm. and, and, and collaborate a little bit easier. I've got to say. I could give that answer, but the truth of it is, I've worked, for example, with two brilliant scholars at Brunel, uh, um, Ruth Simpson and Natasha Slotskaya, and we did our work around dirty work. Uh, and we were looking at um, a literature that was dominated by organizational psychology, which was basically saying, uh, and this was a kind of, uh, a really, a really watered down version of Mary Douglas, that dirt is whatever you think it is, it's a matter of perspective, not empirics. And what we were basically saying is, no, it's not, it's not perspective that hits you when there's a needle in the plastic bag. Uh, 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 dirt actually matters, and when you're a refuse collector, it, 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 it really matters. They couldn't get with Elias. Natasha and Ruth, they just weren't into Elias. And I couldn't get with some of the constructivism that they were employing. So we met in the middle, and we used Bourdieu. Um, and that was good enough. Uh, uh, um, and there's not a single reference to that paper that we, put the one, we got a prize for in WET. I thought there might be one reference to the lights, but it's not an Eliasian paper. There are Eliasian insights in that paper. But we found Bourdieu was our kind of Rosetta Stone there. And I, I don't know if that's right or if, if that's problematic, but I think you've got to compromise, particularly when you work in teams. But actually, I find Bourdieu pretty compatible. And then the, the, the bit, as you know, which brings us on to the next point of your answer that I have a problem with in relation to Bourdieu is the notion of deep structure mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, uh, um, the idea of this thing which is a, 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 a under, underpinning the, the, the interpersonal position practice system that constitutes the field. The field that we, we see is just the field of observable regularities. And this is a reconversion of the classic critical realist idea of the, the split between the noumenal and the phenomenal. That, that, that underpinning that field is another one, that's something deeper, and that's beyond the ken of our observation. If you keep going, you'll end up with something like you know, the structuralist notion of you know, the, the structures of cognition, or you know, the universal distinction between the raw and the cooked, you know, binary and things like that. And uh, uh, I think where Elias takes us is towards completely different conceptual imagery from the notion of deep and surface, towards enduring figurational dynamics, which is, you know, so we have some things like class and gender and, 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 and heteronormativity or whatever it is, which are not so much deep, but enduring, difficult to shake, and embedded in this kind of nexus of figurations that have taken place. So we can talk about structure as being deep, or we can talk about it as being established, I suppose, in these different kind of ways. And so the paper that I'm writing with you, is slightly artificial, uh, <laughs> is to is, is to explore what does that mean? And what does that mean for, if, if the only basis for activism is, and this is wedded to the notion of critique. Critique, in a kind of classical, critical sense, means stripping away the surface, observable, manifest layer towards getting at what's really happening. And it's only, you know, you, you, you tell this to our students, don't we? You know, you've got to be critical, you've got to just accept what's on the surface. You know, that, um, who is it, Peter Berger, the first wisdom of sociology is that things are, are, are not what they seem. And they, 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 they need to go beyond surface appearances. Uh, um, and yeah, it's, it's through being able to uh, strip away the kids. Am I going on too much? No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. A little bit, yeah. I'll get there. Look, I can just come back to my okay. question about, about the kind of links to other theories. I think there's, I, I would put myself more in. Kind of listen. I, I, I break bits off. I use bits. There are, there are bits of a lies that I openly admit that I don't understand. I, I don't get. Symbol theory being one. That Andrew, for tomorrow, so that'd be good. I'm looking for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's bits I don't get. But there's bits that I can see where it adds to, supplements, and overlaps with other sociologists. Other sociologists are available. So for me, the, the whole trinity in my work is Mills. Um, Elias and Jeffcott. But within that is also Labour and Wenger and the notions of community practice. Yeah. You know, you can take you know, Labour and Wenger's 
idea of legitimate peripheral participation yeah. is inherently processual. Yeah. Inherently processual. Yeah. So it's 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 taking what's of analytical utility to answer the questions that you're wrestling with. So you can complement Elias or use Elias to complement others. I think the, the issue is in one of history for Eliasian scholarship is the extent to which Eliasians have wanted to interact with other I mean, other theorists are not going to come looking for Elias. I think it's up to us to actually point out the connections, point out the overlaps, point out where we can contribute. Um, and again, it's years ago, going out for a, a meal with Yo, he, he said exactly that as well, you know, other, other theorists are available. <laughs> you don't always have to do it in the way that Elias writes about. You can deviate from this. And Andrew and I were talking about this. Uh, uh, why is it that there was a generation who, to whom it became relevant to say other theorists are yeah. available? Uh, um, and maybe there was a generation of Eliasian scholars who knew him personally and really saw their role as kind of fighting against a kind of tradition of sociology in which this, this, this man, this figure, this body of work wasn't known uh, um, and wasn't wasn't given the recognition that it deserved, and they saw that as part of what they were doing. Um, whereas there's a new generation now, you yeah. know, the Batten and the Relay Race, who aren't so much into that, uh, um, and uh, don't really don't see that as their fight or their or their cause so much. As yeah, I mean, Alexander, do you remember? I mean, I I I purposely didn't give you any alliance until you were right at the end of your thesis, and then I gave you involvement detachment. And you were like, why the bloody hell didn't you do this? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. This would have been so useful. This like, you didn't want to shut it down your yeah. throat. And that was the thing. Sorry. Yeah, no, this is actually, I think about this often. I mean, not that often. I'm not doing <laughs> research at the moment. But I, I regret not reading it more. Yeah. Uh, but I know it was one of your fears of yeah. not being like, yeah, do this. Yeah. Not, not as and a being region. open to different. Yeah, and, and you might need to be very open until the moment I really needed a lot for yeah. something. Is that that fear of kind of wanting to you know force it? You know, you know I did it the other day in a, in a seminar. And I said I don't want to force my kind of fear out to force the pony is on you. And but it is, is that fear kind of related to the politics though, isn't it? I think yeah. to yeah. an extent. And it's yeah. like well, uh, and I guess related to that is is, is partly what, what I was, was getting up when I was saying. You know, there are bits that the figuration of social just perhaps need to drop or think about dropping in. The, the concept of being a, you know, the most obvious one is civilizing persons or, yeah. or civilization. Yeah. Well, I spoke to Yoko Housman about this, and he he thinks that, that ultimately that should be dropped, mm. and thinks it would have been much better if Norbert had talked about social learning processes. Mm. Mm. But dropping things or not dropping things is not in the gift of anybody. No, right. Yeah. These, these things yeah. will happen yeah. because Elias is out of the bag. I mean, yeah. surely we're not the only people who are not illusions in the room. Mm. You know, we have travelled in the, in, in the opposite direction, yeah. picking up a little bit of Elias or a lot of Elias, yeah. depending upon the, pro the problems in hand. And behind Elias, for me, lies the mass ranks of academic feminism, you know, across, across disciplines. Um, but now Elias is out of the back, and, and, and I, you know, an all power to it in coming out of the back, and I think the collective works is going to mean that that kind of control. I mean, you know, the, the image of the Leicester department was don't go there because they control Elias. They will kill you if you use a bit of Elias and, it's, and they think it's wrong. But those kind, of, you know, whether that was a true perception or a false conception, is, is, you know, doesn't really matter. What I think what matters is. A point comes when a body of ideas no longer belongs to a group of disciples. And if it's to be successful, then, that, then letting go has to be part of, of it. So I think that, you know, for me, that isn't, that isn't even in the room as a, as a possibility. Because people like me are going to come along and say, oh, that's great. And you think it's got to be dropped, got to be dropped. But some poor fool is going to pick it up and think it's extremely helpful. And I think that process is happening. I think the, sorry, I, th I think the comments about Leicester is really, really interesting one because it, I think it shows where, where we've come. I, I think, uh, Liz, you're absolutely right, there, there was a point in time where I think some people engaged with Elias quite fearfully 
because you didn't want to question uh, a kind of dominant view. But then there's another other point of view, which is actually it was, it was never a wholly dominant view. Last year. But, no, sure it was re it was but recent generations, myself and Jason, Michael and others included, have had, to, have had to go so far in the opposite direction to kind of downplay. I mean, we call it this real odd situation now where we're being told to market, market the kind of very thing which is distinctive about Leicester, yeah. but at the same time not force the license to anybody because a lot of our colleagues are not liaising at all. So it's, like, it's a real balance. Um, but I do think that that kind of period in time, what would you say, kind of late 60s to mid 80s? There's, there's, there's something in Elias' work which is, I think, compounds this tendency. I don't think it's just the sort of uh, the idea of a sect and followers, even though we joke about that. Uh, um, it's, it's that, and, and we were talking about this earlier, that there's something in it that really gripes. Uh, um, to the uninitiated reader. I mean, straight away, talking about civilizing processes, you know, particularly up against the backdrop of, you know, post-colonial sociology and, and everything else that goes with that, it's so easy to get the wrong end of the stick there. But what's interesting is we don't seem to get the same kind of with the word culture, which is massively viewed with normative loads. So it's, it's this. Vitlow talked about it as developmental agnosticism. Any, any concept that invokes any kind of notion of development or progress or evolution in the worst cases, it chimes with some of the horrors of scientific racism and eugenics and all that kind of stuff from the Second World War. So we have got like, a we. But that in itself is interesting. That we, who is that we? And, 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 and how has that come to be? How is it that we've got this particular set of sensitivities at this particular moment? That's not a historical accident. But I think, you know, one of the things I know from Eric was the, the thing that got him really riled was when someone would dismiss their lives without really having engaged with the difference between the enic and the etic, etic mm -hmm. senses of, of the civilizing process. That used to really piss him off because it would be like I said, you, you just dismissed it on that really superficial basis and you haven't really got into it. And, and, and he encountered that a great deal. Um, and, and to the other extreme, it maybe eventually came to look like that they were the kind of guardians of a privileged reading of Elias's work and no other reading could be right, you know, and a bit like, you know, decoding you know you understood that. And that's a fine balance to strike. I think the, the other bit of Elias's work which is, is difficult is that it is, one interesting thing about Elias is that there isn't an old Elias and a younger Elias. There's a pretty coherent Elias that goes from, the, you know, you can see how all these different bits link up. And, um, you know, I have a problem, for example, with the idea of these civilizing processes. I find that problematic. All, I, for me, it was renders the civilizing processes normative because they're always trending and counter-trending. But maybe it's useful. And there's been a big debate recently about the idea of functional de democratization and functional de-democratization. And Stephen and Cass have, you know, fallen out and come to blows over this. That's a really important thing. Uh, um, but there is something in Elias's work where um, it is difficult to reconcile. Uh, um, it, it comes with a set of uh, 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 orientations that don't fit easily with certain others. Part, partly related to this split between partisan and non-partisan, if you get with that. Partly in its envisaged relationship with philosophy. It is quite a radical break from philosophy and the way it understands itself. Even though there are some, like Ben J. Masso says, yeah, you can see lots of Ernst Cassera in the Neo-Kantian kind of relational thinkers in some of this uh, uh, thinking. But there is something about it which is, it, it, it asks a great deal of you to get your head around it. So it's hard to, uh, 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 um, and for me, as an, uh, biographically, autobiographically, I had to kind of lose a lot of stuff before I could get my head around the lights. And, I could get, and that, that, that was a kind of investment in itself. So, you know, maybe the, maybe the, the danger of a little bit here and a little bit there is that you can you can end up with a kind of an eclectic mix of irreconcilable principles, or maybe not. Maybe you can you can get that to sit with that, and then you can do so quite self-consciously. Uh, uh, and, and I I'm kind of veering towards the latter. I can see the utility of the latter, and to me, it actually, it fits with this kind of call for an open sociology, uh, um, which which plays to the idea 
of a centre based around a common view of the enterprise, but not a standard paradigm, which is, I guess, what I'm saying. Um, Jim, I'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, no, I just, uh, I just it's, it's, it's interesting sometimes to see what uh, relative outsiders do with Elias. I went to a conference about two months ago, organised by the Latin American Centre in Oxford, called The Civilising Process in Colombia. The people who were at the conference were predominantly historians. They had no problem with the concept of a civilising process. They linked it immediately, automatically, with colonisation, racism and all that. So it's not, it's not a concept that brings problems in the sense that it does for people in my own field. It's, they, they hear the word civilising process and think, oh my god, yeah. this is about you know, white man's bottom and all this other stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, that said, it, it struck me at the end of day one of the conference that what, what they were getting from Elias was not only an interest in long-term processes, but a focus on how particular myths about Colombia had developed over several decades. And the myth that became more and more obvious to me as the conference went on was the myth of Colombia as endemically violent, irredeemably violent. The upshot being there's no point trying to do anything about Colombian society and politics. You are wasting your time. And what this group was doing, it seemed to me, I posed the question, was they were saying, well, look, you know, if we debunk this myth of the eternally violent Colombia, a kind of project emerges, which is reformist, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. um, something about the political imagination shifts by virtue of myth busting. Now, I want to ask you about myth busting in part because when you are uh, commenting on economists, you said, I think, well, they, I forgot how you put it, Jason, but what I heard <laughs> anyway was the various myths about how the economy operated. Yeah. Um, certain practices and policies followed from that. And then you made an interesting normative comment about the brutal effects on people. Yeah. Now this seems to me to be quintessentially LIC, and it goes back to a point that Richard Kilminster makes about the secular humanism in Elias. And Elias, I think anyway, is, is often concerned to point out how analyses that lack reality congruence basically can screw up people's lives. Mm -hmm. Various strategies that have negative consequences for people can stem from inadequate analysis. And of course, he always refers to Marxism yeah. in, this, yeah. in this context. And it may be that you know, Elias thought, you know, we build up the reality congruence, uh, a congruent knowledge, and then eventually we get, we get to secondary involvement. Yeah. Yeah. But there's the interesting literature that's, that's now out there in human figurations. I'm referring to pieces by John Weaver or Ryan Powell in particular, mm -hmm. who are arguing that you can myth bust yeah. with respect to policies regarding Roma people, yeah. with regard to migrants yeah. and labour. You can you can have secondary involvement now based on busting myths. Yeah. And so I wonder to what extent myth busting provides some common ground between different um, sociologists. I mean, it's, it, it seems to me from, I, I mean, I'm not a sociologist, as you know, I'm working in international politics, but I see all sorts of people who are engaged in myth busting in connection with race, in connection with gender, etc., etc., etc. They are put off a lie, see, in sociology because they think it's some kind of, there's some kind of cult yeah. out there with an air of superiority yeah, yeah. Um, that doesn't really want to engage with anybody else. But if you want to draw people in, yeah, <laughs> you can draw them in by saying, well, look, you know, we, there, maybe there is some common ground here on myth-busting. Mm -hmm. um, and myth-busting is about changing, in some sense, one's political imaginaries. Yeah. I think it's a really good point. I think, um, of course, Elias talked about the sociologist as a destroyer of myths. Yeah. I mean, Chris Rojek uh, uh, um, criticises figurational sociologists um, along this ground said that you know, political activism is always relegated to a future that will never come, yeah. a future imagined when we've got enough knowledge to do yeah. something. Yeah. I think it's slightly unfair, because it, it, Elias was obviously an activist in his youth, uh, and Flavio Weisley, 
Um, he was also a family member of the group analytics circle, mm -hmm. together with Fuchs and people like that, in which uh, um, they, they, they were engaged in a small fee with, with, with changing their therapeutic practices. And I think you're absolutely right that, 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 that the myth busting thing itself, being a destroyer of myths, which is a kind of here and now enterprise, is inherently a of enterprise. And that was what I was alluding to earlier, with the idea of Homer Klaus as being a critique of the myth of the sovereign individual thrusting through America and making it great again. Uh, um, and you could almost envisage a kind of a spectrum or a kind of table or a chart or something with what's within the reach of current sociological knowledge and what's outside of it. And on within the reaches of current sociological that knowledge is yet to be able to say this is wrong, <coughs> that isn't right. Uh, um, and particularly at the level of relatively simple figurations, and you know, could start maybe within the reach of sociological knowledge at the moment, uh, uh, but uh, it's, it's, it's for example, yet yeah, group, group therapy, we have to have more or less adequate understandings of groups, and then incredibly complex things, groups. Maybe, maybe that will be more within the reach, but something that wouldn't be within the reach of sociological Knowledge and would take a lot more knowledge would be to avert poverty or you know, mass privation or, or war or something like that. Much more complex figuration involved. So yeah, I'm inclined to agree. And, and of course, economists, there's that fantastic book by Harjun Chang, 23 Things I Don't Tell You About Capitalism, uh, which is, I mean, it's by a, a Cambridge economist, and it's just an absolute expose of not only do economists proffer these kind of slightly spurious models, but they are complicit. In, in knowing that these models are flawed and they're pushing ahead with them nonetheless to inform policy and to, to, to for, for personal gain. Uh, um, so yeah, you can you can imagine sociologists uh, uh, having a role to play in, in criticism. But why aren't our voices being heard? It wouldn't be a new thing for an sociologist to be criticizing uh, a the government's dependence upon spurious economic models or, or on very, very simplistic ideology. Why aren't they? being heard to the same degree that we would expect them to be. And that's, a, that is an institutional question, that is a question of professional influence to a certain degree. Uh, uh, um, and, uh, and that's why some of these things didn't happen. Okay, I'm gonna, we're going to have to quit it there, but thanks, Jason. <laughs> Thank you very much.